I know in last lesson I said that we were going to talk about the profits in this lesson. Oh, excuse me. But, whoops, I lied. I um, <clears throat> forgot about these books. <laughs> so, um, if you're following along in the table of contents in your Bible, we've talked about the books of the law, which was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Number, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then we talked about um, the books of history, um, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, uh, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. So now that takes us to um, what's called the books of of wisdom. <clears throat> and so right after um, Esther, you hit it. Job, um, Psalms. We'll talk about that. That's not really wisdom literature. That's more poetry. But Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Um, so those are the books right there, Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. We're also going to talk about Psalms in this lesson as well, um, because I don't really want to stick it on another lesson, and it's kind of right in the middle of those wisdom books. Um, now, wisdom, these books are called wisdom, but there's oftentimes little wisdom nuggets in other, um, in other parts of the Bible, where like somebody will say something and you're like, oh, that belongs in Proverbs. Um, and, and the same is kind of true for, for for poetry. I know Psalms is, you know, the book of Psalm, that, that's, that's the poetry book. But poetry is in the prophets. Poetry is in the books of the law. Poetry is in the books of history. Poetry is in the books of wisdom. And then Psalms, the, the Psalms have po obviously are, are poetry as well. So you really have poetry, poetry scattered throughout. The Bible isn't a textbook that just plainly says stuff. In fact, most of the time, it won't just plainly say stuff. Most of the time, it'll have creative ways to teach lessons that that, that um, require you to think about what you're reading, um, which I think is one of the reasons why poetry, I'm, I'm sorry, why Psalms says, you know, to meditate on the words, to keep it in your mind. Um, <clears throat> so when reading the books of wisdom, there's the first thing to remember is that they're hardly ever, if ever, going to say things directly. It's not going to be like the books of the law where he says, do this, don't do this. It's going to be a lot different. They're going to say something, and you're going to have to stop and say, now wait, is that a true statement? What does the rest of the book have to say? What does the rest of the Bible have to say? Is this person being sarcastic? Are they being literal? Are they speaking from a place of despair? Or are they speaking from a place of a sound mind? For instance, in Job... Job is grief-stricken. His body is sore. All of his kids are dead. And his wife is not being supportive. And his friends are not being supportive. On top of that, God feels like he's a, mile, a million miles away. And, 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 and so Job just feels like he's completely abandoned. So the things that he's going to say is going to be stricken with grief. See what I mean? I hope that that kind of makes sense. So rarely um, are the books of wisdom going to just say things. They require you to think. They require you to, to stop and reflect on what you read. They require you to finish the whole book before drawing a conclusion. Uh, they require you to, to be open to what the book is trying to say as a whole, what the theme of the book is. Um, yeah. So think when you're reading the books of wisdom. You can't just um, accept something that's said. You have to analyze what's said and, and why it was said and that kind of things. And I'll kind of talk about this a little bit more. Um, second, realize that the books of wisdom contain human emotions. And the, so, so God wrote the Bible. We're, we're all clear on that, right? But he used people to write the Bible, which means that the, the personalities of those authors are going to be in the books of the Bible. And some, in, in some parts more than in other parts. For instance, in the books of the law, you go through these different commands, and obviously it's not going to be that filled with emotion. But then you get to the books of wisdom, and it's practically all emotion. It's just a complete 180 from the books of law. <clears throat> so remember that it contains human emotions, human reasoning, not always from God's perspective. It had, contains stuff from man's perspective, too. Um, but you can still learn a lesson from, and I'm not saying it's not inspired by God. I'm not saying it's not what God exactly what God wanted written. 
What I am saying, though, is you have to be wise and discerning when you're reading the Bible and realize what part is from a man's perspective and what part's from God's. And you can kind of tell by comparing it to the rest of the Bible by really stopping and thinking about what you're reading. So that kind of goes with what I'm saying right there. Clarify with the rest of Scripture. Whenever you read something in the books of wisdom, you're like, well, I'm not real sure compare it with the rest of the Bible. Um, maybe the person wasn't being literal. Maybe the person was lying. See, the Bible accurately records everything that was said, but that doesn't mean that, that what was said was a true statement. Satan says some stuff, like, for instance, in the book of Genesis, Satan says, oh, no, go ahead and eat the fruit. You're not going to die. Well, that's a lie. See what I mean? So, it, But it, 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 the Bible accurately records that lie. Well, how do we know that it was a lie? Because later in Genesis, we find Adam and Eve dying. And in Matthew, we find Jesus coming to save people because they are spiritually dead. See what I mean? So clarify with the rest of Scripture. An example of this is Job 31.3. And this is what it says. It is not calamity for the unrighteous and disaster for the workers of iniquity. This is Job speaking. Is that not true? Well, yes, God will bring judgment on, on, on wicked people. But remember that sometimes judgment will never hit people on this side of eternity. Not that we should be waiting for somebody's destruction. That's not what I'm saying at all. But we have to remember that this statement is generally true. It will In life, things will generally go better for you when you do things the right way rather than being corrupt and dishonest, stealing, and that kind of stuff. However, lots of people are corrupt and they don't see anything happen bad in their life. So, I mean, that's that's one of the things that happens, that's happening for Job. He was seeking God and he's like, you know, I don't understand what's going on, God. The wicked people are left standing, and here you are smiting me. I don't understand this. What's going on? So you have to really be open to what's going on. Kind of really pay attention to the to to the to the events as they unfold and what people are saying. So is calamity for the unrighteous? Ultimately, yes. However, the rain falls on everyone, and sometimes God does things that we don't understand. So that starts with Job. Now the thing about Job is. God still used it to bless Job. See what I mean? He still used it to bless Job. Job ended up more blessed in the end than he was before, even though God never answered his questions. Um, it was written by anonymously, maybe sometime during like the 700s or something, but as far as when did the events of Job happen, they happened somewhere before Genesis 12. So um, if you're reading the Bible through in the order of the events, you read through, you know, Genesis, you start in Genesis 1 and you're all going and then somewhere in there is, is Job and then you get to Genesis 12. So um, it deals with the question, why do the righteous suffer? If you've ever been in a situation like that, you know exactly what, uh, what I'm talking about. Why, why am I suffering? What did I do that's so wrong? Surely there's more, someone out there more wicked than me. Um, but the thing about Job and a lot of the Bible is that it uses extremes to teach a lesson. See, Job wasn't just a person or even a good person. He was a righteous person, a very righteous person. Um, it wasn't just a demon or just a, a, a bad person who was persecuting him. It was Satan himself. It wasn't just um, that, that Satan weaseled in. It's that God allowed him to. See what I mean? And it, all these questions of why. Why did God do that? See what I mean? And it doesn't really answer those questions, does it? It doesn't say, why did God allow that to happen to Job? It doesn't say whether God had alter, alternate reasons than just to uh, to grant Satan his wish. See what I mean? It, it doesn't say that. Maybe God had his own reasons for doing that. See what I mean? It doesn't really clarify. What it does talk about, though, is a righteous person... The most righteous person in the land, go un undergoing unfair treatment without support, and God ends up reprimanding the friends, but not Job. So, uh, one thing that's important when you're reading through Job is remember that there are many reasons for suffering. Sometimes we do suffer because we're, we're living in sin. Sometimes we suffer because... Um, it's just uh, the after effects of what somebody else did. Like, for instance, let's say my brother steals, and then he hides his stuff in my house, and then I get busted for it. 
Well, I didn't know that the that the stolen stuff was in my house. See what I mean? But it's still because somebody else made a bad decision. It affects you. But then there's other things that are natural occurrences. Things like lightning striking, fire starting, uh, earthquakes, stuff like that. Things that are called natural disasters or uh, uh, works of God, I think is what they're called. Um, and so there's a lot of different reasons for suffering. And Job's friends had solutions for a lot of the reasons why he was suffering. And a lot of the things that they said were true in other contexts. They were just not true of Job. Oh, well, Job, this is what you need to change. I've got all the answers. Well, I mean, that's true in some cases, but it doesn't apply here. See, because Job didn't do anything wrong. In fact, that's one of the points of Job, was that Job was a, was a righteous person who didn't do anything wrong, and it still happened to him. That's one of the points. The righteous person is suffering, not the, not the unrighteous person suffering. Um, so that's what I'm talking about, where I, where I said back here on this other slide, um, that it's not often time to direct. That you, you have, they have to use your brain. Um, some of the things that Job's friends say are true. They're just not true in this situation. Well, how do you know that? By reading the rest of the book, by paying attention. Um, so this is the first of three exceptions to, to Proverbs. Proverbs says this is how you should live. But in Job, we find a contrast to that. Proverbs says if you do this, if you honor God, if you do this, things are going to go well for you. Well, Job was honoring God, and things didn't go well for him. The exception to Proverbs. Pro and we'll talk about this in just a second. Proverbs are general principles of life. But Job is the exception to those general principles of life. That sometimes, even the righteous suffer. See, the rain falls on everyone, and you have to realize that sometimes, sometimes things aren't going to happen the way that you like or the way that you understand. Which takes us to the book of Proverbs. This was written by King Solomon. However, some of so uh, the book of Proverbs was added by King Hezekiah later in the 700s. Now, the part that I, the parts that King Hezekiah added were still by King Solomon. They were just added to the book by King Hezekiah. Okay, but they were the whole, all of it was written by King uh, King Solomon except for that part at the end where it says the sayings of Agur on, on the mule or whatever around chapter 30 somewhere. And that wasn't written by King Solomon, but everything else was. Um, okay, so that that means it, you know this was happened sometime in the 950s somewhere BC, obviously, um, that King Solomon um, said this. Um, so the the thing when when reading Proverbs is to understand this. They are not a promise and they are not commands. They are principles proven true by experience. Generally speaking, if you act this way, this is going to be the result. Generally speaking, if you're lazy and don't work, you're not going to have money. Generally speaking, if you waste all your money on, 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 on less of the flesh, you're not going to have any money. Generally speaking, yes. But then there are some people who make a living off of, off of less of the flesh. See what I mean? Generally speaking, there is no such thing as quick, money, quick and easy money. You have to work hard for it. However, sometimes people inherit money. Sometimes people just give money to somebody else. Like, or sometimes they win it like a lottery. So, I mean, the Proverbs are not promises. They're not saying every single time that you do this, this is going to happen. And it's not a command that you must live like this. It's saying this is, generally speaking, these are principles of life that I have proven to be true by using them in life. Generally speaking, if you raise a child in the way that they should go, they keep those things with them. If you do it in the right, if you do it in the right way, it increases the chances. But still, I've seen totally rebellious kids who are still clean people because their parents taught them to clean up after themselves. See what I mean? Now, once again, this is not a promise. Not every single time are your kids going to be righteous because you are righteous, and it's not a command. Um, and I hope that that kind of makes sense. So I'm not really going to elaborate too much on that because I think I already did. But yeah, okay. Um, also, Proverbs is very practical, whereas a lot of other books are real spiritual. Proverbs is not so much. Proverbs is probably the least spiritual book in the whole Bible. It's just real practical things. Okay, this is what you need to do with your money. This is, this is what you need to do with parenting, with being a husband, with being a wife. This is kind of the idea of life. Well, okay. 
See what I mean? It, it doesn't really have to do with, oh, and by the way, this is how this. No, it's real practical. However, these practical things were revealed to King Solomon by God. Never remember, never forget that, because some people say, oh, Proverbs is less spiritual, so I shouldn't read it. No, 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 you should read it the same as all the other books. Um, rather, it's just a different type of literature than the other books. Like all the Bible is different. It's still revealed by God. Um it is not just like King Solomon just conjured up these things in his mind. Um, so then uh, the general theme of Proverbs is how to approach life. And that's why Job is an exception to that. Um, because that this is just generally speaking. So which takes us to the book of Ecclesiastes. This was also written by King Solomon. That means it was written sometime around the 950s. Um, and Ecclesiastes deals with the question, what is my purpose in life? Why do I exist? And you see throughout Ecclesiastes, he traces these different things, um, being being uh, being reasonable and, and trying to think, what, what's my purpose in life, living wisely, doing the right things, living foolishly, indulging the lust of the flesh, getting drunk, doing whatever the heck you want, whenever the heck you want. He goes through all these different things that, that, that he tried to do to find purpose in life. But he says that he didn't find reason in any of those things. It was all for vanity. No, none of it None of it mattered in the end. Why? Because nothing matters without God. You can live as wisely or as foolishly as you want, but at the end of the day, if God is not the center of your, of your world, you're not going to find purpose, you're not going to find fulfillment, you're not going to find happiness. It's not going to matter. None of it's going to matter. Think about this. You live very wisely. You save every penny you can. You have all this money. You build an empire. You're the CEO of a major corporation, but then you die. And you leave that work to somebody else, and it doesn't matter at all. People will forget you in, within 100 years. See what I mean? It doesn't matter without God. And that's the point of Ecclesiastes, which means that this is the second exception to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs. Nothing matters without God. You can be wise, foolish. You can try to reach uh, fulfillment through reasoning, through emotions. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters without God. The best you can do without God is to just learn to learn to enjoy your life because it's not going to get much better than that. However, with God at the center, that changes things. Um, so then, and that's actually how the book of Ecclesiastes ends, um, is, is pointing to God. So then that takes us to Song of Solomon. Now, Song of Solomon is probably one of the most misused and misunderstood books in the Bible. Um, there's, I, off the top of my head, the, the books that are most misunderstood in the Bible, Song of Solomon, First off, um, uh, Hebrews and James and Revelation. I would say that those four books um, are the most misunderstood books in the Bible. So Song of Solomon was written by King Solomon once again, which means it was written sometime around the 950s somewhere. You know, he was he became king in like what in the 970s somewhere and and died in like nine or yeah died in like 930 or something like that. So I mean it's kind of a big window there. Um, Generally speaking, it's it, not not generally speaking, but for me, I always assumed that Song of Solomon was written when Solomon was younger, and Ecclesiastes when he was older, but I could be wrong on that. So, as far as the name, the Song of Songs, basically what it's saying is the best song, the song without compare, the love song. Um, this is the third exception to Proverbs: love is not rational. You can know everything to look for in a wife or a husband. A uh, well, want a husband needs to not be lazy. He needs to be, you know, um, diligent, a hard worker. He needs to this, that, and that other thing. A wife needs to be a supporter. She needs to do this and this and this. Right, but sometimes when you're when you're picking a wife, you don't really go by their um, their credentials. You go by love. Love is not rational. It doesn't think things through. It doesn't say, you know what. This person might not be the best choice. See what I mean? Because love, the heart wants what the heart wants. You know what I mean? And emotions are very strong. And Song of Solomon is talking about that, the emotions that people feel. Um, so from Song of Solomon, we see that sexual intimacy is good. It's all right. It's a good thing. Um, I know some, sometimes in church history, they've kind of downplayed the whole idea of sexual intimacy. It's only for procreation. Well, no, not not really. Um 
sex is for sex is for um, comfort. It's for connection. It's for relaxation. It's for procreation. But I mean, you know what I mean. It, it has many many reasons. So we see from Song of Solomon that sexual intimacy is a good thing. It's not it's not wrong to have to be intimate with your wife. Um, see, the problem is is that people have an unbalanced view of sexuality. Either they say anything goes, homosexuality, transgender, whatever. Or they go to the other extreme and say, you have to be married and you can't enjoy it. You can't lust after your wife, you can't anything. Well, hold on. That's not what the Bible says. So, um, that and people always get confused with Song of Solomon because it's not, it, it, once again, it's a book of wisdom. It causes you to have to think about things. And so people don't really understand where to go with that. So people always ask, is it about God's love for Israel? Is it about Jesus' love for the church? Or is it about people? So these are some reasons why I would say it's about people. Let me move my webcam out of the way. First off, what did the original audience think it was about? Well, the original audience thought it was about people. What does it claim to be in the, in, the book of, 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 of Sol, of the, in the book of Song of Solomon? It claims to be a love poem. It claims to be about two people, two people's love for each other. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, what happens when we compare it to other love songs that were written about the same time? Well, we see that it matches up as a love song. It, it's written in the same format. There's nothing in it that says, hey, this is not a love song between two people. Um, also, th there's the point about this. We don't have sex with God. And if... If Song of Solomon is about God's love for for people, that means that we have sex with God, which is just gross. It's a gross thing to say. Um, so uh, I would strongly say this is not what's called an allegory, which means it's metaphorical for God and people. It's not literal for husband and wife. So there is no reason in the text to assume it's not about people other than trying to find a super spiritual meaning in a book that's not so super spiritual. See what I mean? People ha think that for the Bible to be from God and about and, and teaches about righteousness, that every single line of every single thing has to be about God. So what they do is they it's called allegorizing. So like in the books of Leviticus and Numbers, when it talks about the tent and the and the and the pegs that they used in the tent, that all has to mean something. No, it, no, it doesn't. It was an actual, literal tabernacle that the Ark of the Covenant was in. See what I mean? Um, and people just get really carried away. Yes, the Bible is from God, but not every single line is about God himself. See what I mean? God gave us practical things and spiritual things to help us in our growth and development. How would we... Well, I think you kind of get what I'm saying. So going, going back to this. That takes us through the books of wisdom. And remember, even throughout Psalms... The idea is to think, to think what you're reading, to think about it. So um, that takes us to the to the poetry. Now remember, I said poetry is in many books. It's in many of the books of the Bible: the prophets, the law, the history, the obviously the wisdom and the poetry. Duh. But it, it's throughout the books. Okay. The first thing about poetry is it has structure. It has different. Um, it's written in, in, in a very um, musically oriented way it has beat it has pattern it has structure um it, it's not just um something to read through it's something where um they could have said it in a plainer way but they decided to say it in a more colorful way um the poetry poetry is very creative and so when you're reading it, you have to kind of keep that in mind here's an example of some structure from psalm 19:1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Did you notice how it says the same thing twice? The heavens declare, the sky above proclaims. The glory of God, his handiwork. See what I mean? It's not saying two different things. It's saying two, this exact same thing in two different ways. See? Poetry has structure to it. It has a method to it. Um, it doesn't just come out and say things. It takes a scenic route. And whereas a few words... Um, it could have just said something. It doesn't do that. It takes this long way of saying something. A lot like the books of wisdom. Um, so then also there's something that's kind of important called chiasm. And I know it's that's a really big word. Like I say, I, this is this class is not meant for academ academia. It's meant for, for new, new Christians. And I'm sorry that I had to use such a big word. But chiasm is a poetry device or, or a way of writing in poetry that goes like this. Point A, 
point B, point C. Then it goes back, point B, point A. Okay. Now I'm going to show you that in Genesis 11. Now the whole by and the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, "Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly." <clears throat> and they had brick for stone and uh, bitumen for mortar. Then they said, "Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top to the in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves." Let, lest we dis be dispersed in the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, to, and the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all they all have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from, from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from the Lord dispersed them, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. So then we we kind of break this apart, and we see that it's a chiasm. It starts out point A. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. Um, and then at the very end, it ends with um, the Lord confused their language, and from there, from there they scattered throughout the earth. Then point point C, they went to Shinar and settled there. Then at the very end, um, they called it Babel because because the Lord had confused them there. Um, then point uh, E, they said, "Come, let us build for ourselves." And then and, and down here it says um, that. Um, and the tower, uh, the Lord came to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And point F, um, a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And then down here to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. So I'll kind of guide you through it. Now the whole earth, point A, used point B, the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, point C, and settled there. They said to one another, come, point D, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they uh, used bricks for stone, and they used tar for mortar. They said, point E, come let us build for ourselves a city, point F, and a tower whose top will reach into heaven, and let us make for ourselves a name, otherwise we'll be scattered ab ab abroad over the face of the whole earth, point G. The Lord came down, point F, to see the city and the tower which the sons of men, uh, point E, had built. The Lord said, behold, there are one people, and they ha all have the same language. And this is the th uh, what they began to do, and now nothing was which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Do you see how it goes out and comes back? It starts and ends on the same point. And whatever's in the center is probably the most important thing. If what's in the center of Genesis 11 is that God came down. What's at the start is that they all had one language. What's at the end is that they all had a different language. See what I mean? At the start, they, they settled in Shinar. At the end, they left, left and called it the Tower of Babel. See what I mean? It's... it's um, it's it's a way of doing that. For instance, the book of Deuteronomy is a is a long chiasm. It starts and ends the same way. It, it starts out like this and it comes back and it goes back. Saint Corinthians is a chiasm. It starts with a point and it ends on that same point and it has some other things in the middle. Is that what I mean? Um, and the Proverbs will frequently do this. Like let's say let's say this. Uh, point A would be, I'm in my office. Point B, writing um, on my computer. Point C, for a Bible class. Point B, on my computer, I'm almost finished. Point A, in my office. See what I mean? Um, the chiasm is a little bit difficult to, to kind of get the knack of, but it's very important, and it comes up very frequently throughout the Bible. And I'll try to uh, point out parts of it that are that are chiasm. So, um, and if, if you don't understand that... Um, I'll, I'll try to post up more more stuff about it. Um, it's also in my Old Testament Made Easy class, and again in my New Testament Made Easy class. Um, Psalms, uh, the, bo the book of Psalms was compiled uh, sometime during the exile, um, but as far as when the books were written, they were written all the way back from the day of Moses. King, King David wrote some, the, a guy called Asaph and the sons of Korah made some, or wrote some. Uh, then people during the exile wrote some, so it's kind of widespread. Um, however, some psalms uh, point to the coming Christ, and that is Jesus. So Psalm 22, for instance, is one of these. Now, in, in the Gospels, Jesus says, Oh, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
So then we turn to Psalm 22, and what does it say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me and from the words of my groaning? See, it pointed to Christ. Um, yes, somebody was actually going through a difficult time, but what they wrote was pointed forward to Christ. Um, usually from people's view, not necessarily right statements. Um, remember what I was talking about before. It, it, the Psalms and a lot of the books of wisdom aren't necessarily going to be true in what, or, or correct in what they say, but it's going to be um, something that is what somebody was actually feeling at the time. Psalm 137 is a great example of that. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our lyres, for there our captors required of us, so of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. See, can't you just feel the the the, the anger and sorrow in their voice that they're in this land that they don't even know, they don't like this land. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, how they said, lay it bare, lay it bare, down its foundations. See, Edom um, was against Israel when they were falling, and so as a result, a lot of bad things happened. I don't really have time to get into it. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall be he who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall be shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rocks. So he's saying, this is what has happened to us. Um, how I wish it would happen back to you. This is his actual emotions. But keep in mind, he's trusting God throughout it. He's just expressing in words how irritated he is at the situation. Have you ever been irritated at a situation and said something wrong? Well, the the writer of Psalm, the writers here have too. Um, but we know from the New Testament we're supposed to forgive those who persecute us, right? To bless them. So, anyways, um, I hope that you understand the idea of a chiasm. It'll start on, on a point, it'll end on the point. Sometimes it'll be opposite points. Like, let's say point A would be I came to my office, but point A at the end would be I left my office. Point A, I came to my office, point B, and, and got on my computer. Point C, I then finished up my lesson. So I, point a B, so I uh, got up from my computer, point A, and I left my office. Does that make sense? It's a chi it's, That's called a chiasm. Um, hopefully you can um, look up chiasms on the internet or something and find some more examples. Um, but yeah. So um, I, I, with that, the, with this lesson is finished. Um, if there are any questions, please post them in the comments below. I'll get back to them as soon as I can. If I didn't explain anything, please let me know. Um, yeah. God bless. Thank you for